सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवावहै तेजस्वी लावधी तमस्तु मा विद्विशावहै ओम शांति 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 साई राम एवरी वन साई राम सो टुडे द आइडिया वाज टू स्टार्ट स्पेंडिंग सम टाइम टू स्टडी द शिवोपासना मंत्र सो आई वुड लाइक टू स्टार्ट विद स्मॉल इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ what shivopasana mantra is where it is in the vedas because we all say vedic chanting but i think to know from which text uh, and where it is coming from will be some information which is useful at least that way we know what are we chanting where is it stated and where does it belong and so on so i'm just going to give a very short introduction uh, some of it you all may know but i thought for those who may not be familiar I thought it's good to give a very high level introduction. Um, the Vedas are four in number, I think, as all of you would know. They are Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharvana Veda. This is the way um, sage Veda Vyasa has uh, categorized them or classified them. And um, the Rig Veda basically deals with uh, prayers, worship, um, praising the Lord with various mantras. Yajur Veda contains what are called Yajus, um, which are mantras which are used in the sacrifices, um, fire sacrifices mainly. Yajna. Um, the Sama Veda is, um, contains same mantras actually more or less from what is pre uh, present in the Rig Veda or Yajur Veda, but they are all in song form. They basically, they are songs. Sama means song. Atharvana Veda deals with miscellaneous type of um, topics, um, uh, which are related to the Vedic sacrifices, Vedic life, um, and so on. Okay. Uh, these, each of these Vedas is classified into four sections, you can say, four types of uh, texts. The first one is Samhita, Samhitas, as uh, it's written in English. Um, these, they are just collection of mantras. Uh, they are just describing the divinity, uh, which is prevalent everywhere in various uh, ways the second type of text is brahmanas okay brahmanas they go into detail of um, how they, ex they basically explain some of the samhita mantras how they are to be used um, and certain guidance as to how the vedic rituals are to be performed um, they could also be considered some form of a commentary of um, explanation of the mantras, what's contained in the Samhita, so what is related to the Samhitas. The third type of texts are called Aranyakas or Aranyakani. Um, they are <clears throat> texts which are devised for study of by people who have retired from active life. They have gone to the forest after they completed their Grihastashrama, that is 
householder uh, life. They go to the forest and live and study the Vedas, and they are called Vanaprasthas. Vanaprasthi means those who are living in the forest. They study, and for them, there have been uh, texts outlined. So they are called Aranyakas. Then come certain texts called Upanishads. They are can, they contain philosophical truths of uh, of a higher nature uh, because the others have deal with the world also to some extent, but the Upanishads are of, of, of an esoteric nature. They talk of a higher truth, and they are considered also the Jnana Kanda, or they are also called Vedanta, okay, because they are the uh, concluding texts of the Vedas also. So Vedanta's uh, texts, they are called Upanishad. So that is in a nutshell, the four categories. So then now we will go to what the Shivopa, where the Shivopasana mantra occurs. If you take the Yajur Veda, which is second Veda of the four Vedas, Yajur Veda has two divisions. Okay, the one is called Shukla Yajur Veda. The other one is called Krishna Yajur Veda. Shukla means white, Krishna means dark uh, or black. And um, the Krishna Yajur Veda is the Rishi who, who gave, who initiated that branch is Vaisampayana. Shukla Yajur Veda is by Yatna Valkya, is the Rishi. And of the Krishna Yajur Veda, which is very prevalent in South India mainly, among all the other all the four Vedas, uh, Yajur Veda is the most uh, popular, um, I would say, in India, or it has more widespread. And of this, the Krishna Yajur Veda is predominantly practiced in the south in south of India. And um, the Krishna, uh, Krishna Yajur Veda has va various branches. Um, most branches are lost, and there are various numbers given uh, of how many uh, branches were there. But um, there's only one which is more predominant. There are two, apparently, two shakas which are prevalent. Of these two, there's only one which is the most prevalent, which is called the Taitriya Shaka. Taitriya Shaka. Um, I think I have the names, so I'm just maybe I should point out. Yes. Okay, so you can say Yajur Veda, uh, Shukla Yajur Veda, Krishna Yajur Veda, Shaka means a branch. So the Krishna Yajur Veda has Taitiriya Shaka, which is the most prevalent. And um, under this, the Aranyaka text, the Aranyakam under this branch is called Taitiriya Aranyakam. Okay. And this Taitiriya Aranyakam has what I call Prapathaka. So they are called, you can call them chapters. And so the Taitiriya Aranyaka has 10 chapters. And of these 10 chapters, the 10th chapter. Okay, the last prapataka is called Maha Narayano Panishad. Maha Narayano Panishad. Okay. As you can see, the Aranyaka, so if you take the Taitriya <coughs> Aranyaka, the 7th, 8th, and 9th chapters are called uh, um, Taitriya Upanishad. Okay, and they are, there are three valleys called uh, Shiksha Valley, Rudu Valley, Ananda Valley, and so on. Um, there are three valleys, so all of them are considered Upanishads also. So you can say out of the ten, the last four are considered Upanishads. Um, so the last one is called Mahanarayana Upanishad. It's one of the largest Upanishads, and um, it has it has what I call 80 Anuvakas. I think many of you, are, some of you may know Rudram, it has 11 Anuvaka. So Anuvaka is a collection of mantras, which is uh, 
uh, called an anuvaka. It's th that's the way they are classified. So there are 80 anuvakas. Uh, there are many mantras which we use, including the say, for example, Triambakam Yajamahe, occurs in this um, one of the anuvakas of the Mahanarayan Upanishad. So there are many mantras which are part of this uh, Upanishad, many collection of mantras or anuvakas which have become very popular. Uh, even Sandhya Vantanam, uh, when people uh, do, any of the mantras which they use come from this uh, Mahanarayan Upanishad. So this, uh, uh, there is a 16th Anuvaka, it's called Shoda Shonuvaka, Shodasha Anuvaka, okay. 16th Anuvaka, that is called Shivopasana Mantra. That is a collection of mantra which are useful for Shiva Upasana. Shiva Upasana means worship of the worship of Shiva. These mantras worship Lord Shiva. So they become very useful in the worship of Lord Shiva, as we understand. But in the, uh, the tradition of uh, Vedas, uh, Shiva, as we described, was not there. But the concept that auspiciousness, that which makes everything in this world auspicious, is called Shiva. And how to worship that Shiva? That's so, uh, an aspect of Brahman. Um, so these mantras help us worship Shiva. So that in a nutshell, you know, I, I hope I didn't run through, rush through. It is there for you all to read. I have written it out in sentence form um, in these uh, two slides. Um, you all can read it and see. Okay. Uh, but I thought I would just go over them. So you, as you can understand, Shuvapasana Mantra occurs in the Mahanarayan Upanishad, which is a portion, it's an Upanishad, but forms part of the Aranyaka. So as you can see, it, uh, the Aranyakas to Upanishads is the end of Aranyaka text is Upanishads. Okay, so you can see that also. Uh, but they are given specific names because of the philosophical nature of those texts. Um, so I, and so it's in Krishna Yajurveda, uh, Taitriya Aranyaka, and Mahanarayan Upanishad. Within that, the 16th Anuvaka is Shivasa, Shivapasana Mantra. So just, just to give you the context of where it is. I do not pause. If there are any questions, I will answer. Otherwise, we will move on to the mantras proper. There are no questions. Sai Ram, Uncle. Um, yes. You had mentioned that the Upanishads are um, also called the Jnana Kanda. Yes. Um, so then, is it the Aranyakas or the um, Upasana Kanda? Or is there, isn't there like Karma Kanda? Yeah, so you see, the thing is, the Karma Kanda is generally the Brahman, generally, okay, I will, uh, predominantly the Karma Kanta section is um, uh, in the way, uh, Samhitas and the Brahmanas. Okay. But they also are used for Upasana. Upasana Kanda is not necessarily a specific area because mm -hmm. Upasana is any form of practice and worship. So if you worship through action, it falls under Karma. You worship through jnana, it falls under uh, jnana kanda also. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a fluid uh, classification. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say that, uh, like, Sivas Pasana mantra is upasana. So mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of upasana, which is, you can find them in the brahmanas as well as <clears throat> aranyakas, mm -hmm. which uh, talk of various ways of worship. Okay, I hope that uh, answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, so it is um, it is not a watertight you know, separation. Uh, like mm -hmm. for example, if you look at Sri Rudram, Sri Rudram is actually occurring in the Samhita portion. But Sri Rudram is also called Rudropanishad. Because they say Rudram can be used as Upasana, it can be used for your karmas, how you live your life, as well as there are philosophical truths. So sometimes some of the mantras can be used in three different ways. Uh, Rudram falls under that category. Um, so, you, but you can say the, um, the Aranyakas will have a bit of uh, Upasana and uh, because Karma is not as much in a uh, Aranyaka because you have uh, renounced all worldly activities and you have come. Rituals mm -hmm. are less in um, Aranyaka. It is more of worship 
and contemplation. So I could say that though. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we will go to the first mantra. Uh, just to put things into perspective, you know, I am not going to focus on how you chant. Uh, there are other streams of uh, 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 learning which is going on where there are um, um, volunteers who are teaching, instructing on how these are to be chanted. So I would just try to leave, a, a go, um, keep that away. I don't want uh, uh, this to be evolving into a chanting class. Um, I think if you have any chanting related questions, you should ask uh, from the people who are teaching you the chanting. But I will explain to you what the Sanskrit letters are and what the pronunciation is. I will spend time on that and then the meaning and a more esoteric or inner meaning of these names. Okay, that's the goal of this class. Um, so I hope it's, uh, I set the context. Okay, so we will, um, the first one, Nidhana Pataye Namaha. Nidhana Pataye Namaha. So the second letter is, Mahaprana or extra air you have to give. Otherwise, all the others are alpha prana sounds. Ni dhana pataye namaha. So nidhana pataye is the fourth vibhakti, means to the nidhana pati. Nidhana pati is the simple noun name. And so nidhana pataye means to that nidhana pati salutations. Okay, that's what the meaning is. So now we look at what is Nidhana Pati. Nidhana and Pati are two different words. Let's take the first word Nidhana. Uh, you will find say, various meanings. In some places you will find people saying it's a death. In some places they will say it's a dissolution. These are two meanings which are prevalent you can find. Um, but what is, is, see, death has many, many names also associated with. So, but we will just try to analyze etymologically what is this, what does this word comprise of, and then we'll try to understand, okay? So I've given the word final rest or conclusion. Okay, these are the two meanings I've put down here. There are, can be about 20, 30 meanings which are prevalent, but I just picked two. I will just go over them. The first part of that word is called ni. The second part is dhana. Ni is what is called, ni, there, are, there are certain um, prepositions, so you can say, or particles, or whatever you want to, I don't know, English does not have an equivalent, but I think there are similar usages in English, but there are prefix. Upasarga is the name. I have not put the Sanskrit word here. The word uses upa. Sarga. Uh, there are many which you may have come across, like pari, pra, ni, nir, and so on. V. So there are about 20 odd upasargas which are prevalent, which are listed actually. So ni is one of them. It generally indicates a sense of down. That's what they say. There's no real meaning, but it indicates, gives you a sense of a particular quality. Okay. Um, you, there are other words which you all may have come across. Nivasa. Okay. It's a very common word, you would say. Nivritti. And these are two words uh, you may have come across. So <clears throat> let's take the nivasa. Vasa means one who resides in somewhere. Vasati. Vasati means to live, to be in some place. It's called vasa. Like Parti Vasa, like that we will sing, Kailasa Vasa. So means one who resides in Kailasa. Then what is Nivasa means? One who sits down, one who settles down. Settling is Vasa means settling down is Nivasa. That means he has rested, come to a rest in that place. Permanently taken aboard, Nivasa. Nivritti. Nivr pravritti, nivritti, margas are there. 
Pravritti means they will say external world. Nivritti means internal world. It also means Pravritti means one who is active in the world. Nivritti means one who is goes to the Aranya, you know, forest. He takes goes away from activity and goes inwards. Going inward also is considered rest. So this that is the usage of ni. Okay, so you sort of get the sense of I just gave you two words. Then we look at the word dhana. Dhana means wealth. Wealth of all kinds. Okay, it can be uh, monetary wealth, education, knowledge, vidyadhanam. Okay, so there are various kinds of wealth. So you can also th think of these things. They are all resources available in this world for us to live a good life. So dhanam is anything with which we can live, lead a life. All the implements, all the resources, all the skills, all the knowledge which God has given is dhana. You can say Ashtalakshmi. So, so dhana is whatever we use in this world, you can say, whatever is gifted by God. Okay, so that is dhana. So nidhana means when you put all this down, when all what God has given, including our body, is just put down, settled, that is state is called nidhana. Okay. So that is, when does it happen? The final rest is when we die. We have done all the work. Now we take rest. So that is the state of nidhana. Pati, the master of that. Okay. So you can imagine, you know, why are we starting this entire mantra with nidhana pati? Um, because the human beings, the, 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 the most toughest fear everyone has is death, fear of death. We don't know what happens when we die. That's a question everyone has. All the other questions, you can find answers. But this is a question no one has answered. But the rishis have found, or the God has revealed to the rishis, that when you die, I am there. Okay, Nidhana Pati. So who controls, who is the master of death? That's why Shiva is always considered the person who is responsible for dissolution, destruction. Because when that happens, he is the one in charge. Why do we, we say this? So whenever, before we pray, start with this first prayer itself oh lord when i die i am with you you are with me you are the one who is control because this should take away our uncertainty about death because god will be there when we die god is the one who is taking charge because once we have that understanding the life itself is shiva life and death both will become shiva so you can you can imagine shiva means auspiciousness so they start the mantra with death. Death, we are afraid because we don't want to let go of this world. So that is what, so salutation to the Lord or master of the final state. So that is the way we start the mantra. So whenever we chant the mantra, we should say, we should not be afraid of the death because when death happens for to us or to others, there's nothing to be worried. We should know that the auspicious Lord Shiva is there. He is taking charge. Because once that thought is firmly instilled, nothing in this world should matter to us. So that is the purpose of Shiva. Until we get this, there will not be auspiciousness. So that's why this, with this mantra, the set of mantras of worship of Shiva starts. That's why he is considered the one who is in the crematorium. He applies the ash from the crematorium. Okay, when he is there, then why are we worried? Why are we crying? Why are we sad? Why are we afraid? So this is the meaning of this mantra. That's why it starts with this. But we will um, dwell a little more on this word. <clears throat> because I thought, you know, there are um, other things which we can discuss. So, you know, anything related also I'm bringing. Because... 
one of the way we understand study some of the mantras is where is it used in the other text scriptures because they give us a sense of how to understand this so i have taken a chapter uh, a, a section from uh, one of the verse in the bhagavad gita oh sorry i'm very sorry i think i copied and pasted this is from one second chapter 3 i think it's from chapter 3 give me a minute uh, let me okay i will fix it later it's it comes in chapter 3 okay krishna tells arjuna swadharme nidhanam shreyah oh i will remove that for now or fix it later swadharme nidhanam shreyah swadharme in swadharma nidhanam means attaining one's end or dying shreyah it says shreyah means beatitude or bliss or happiness or more excellent these are multiple meanings swami says shreyas and prayas shreyas is anything spiritual aspiring that heights of spiritual achievement is shreyas an exalted state okay so krishna is telling arjuna ending one's life coming to rest in one's life while performing swadharma is shreyah but we also can say swadharma is your atma dharma so that means taking final rest in the atman is the best okay so he is saying don't don't worry about other dharmas you know par dharmas the dharma which does not belong to you but krishna also tells arjuna you are a kshatriya so you have to do your bodily dharma also and doing that when you end your life that is the most exalted thing to do so that's what he saying so attaining the end of one's life journey grants one final beatitude is what i said because shreyah is also called the final nishreyah means final beauty you come to that resting in that exalted state okay nishreyah is another meaning so nidanam shreya means swadharma if you do your swadharma so in that sense krishna has used the swami often uh, Um, quotes this so i thought i will just mention that nidhanam um, another uh, area where uh, this nidhanam is used i have not given uh, the extracts here because otherwise it's getting too much um, for example in the sama veda tradition uh, nidhanam is the final part of the prayers nidhanam um, which means the ending the resting the concluding section is uh, are called also nidhana um there is also one quotation uh, says there are five types of animals which have to be sacrificed um and the purusho nidhanam <coughs> it says purusha is nidhana so you can say purusha nidhanam means uh, you can say it's also one type of sacrifice they, they will say human they will say goat is one type of sacrifice uh, sheep is one type of sacrifice a cow is one like that they have listed but the last one is purusho nidana as many people think it's human sacrifice okay but actually purusho nidana means sacrificing oneself is nidana that's a final state the purusha also means divinity brahman the sacrifice of brahman is nidana so there are multiple meanings of that so i thought i would just mention because otherwise we will go into another discussion <clears throat> but i think it gives you a sense so anything which concludes come to rest comes to an end when everything is put down that state is called nidhana <clears throat> i'm just going to stop okay i should have just so so i said you know dhana Now we talked about dhana, so I thought nidhana. 
so i thought i will get some excerpt from swami's uh, uh, discourse and talk about it swami is talking about sadhana we say we are doing sadhana you know we say so swami is explaining what sadhana is so i'll just read out swami is posing the question so somebody has shloka 35 thank you very much sister shobhna i will fix this uh, sorry thanks to sister shobhana who looked it up for me thank you so swami is talking about sadhana what is sadhana sadhana is sa plus dhana the sa in the word sadhana implies salokya samipya sarupya and sayujya these are the four types of muktis or liberation salokya means perception of the divine means you see or you are in the same world samipya is proximity you are close to divinity sarupya is having the form of the divinity or identifying oneself as divinity sayujya is complete merger yujya to join yuj that is merger these are four types of muktis all of them have used the word sa 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 so swami says the sadhana the sa actually stands for these four okay then he goes on to dhana okay this is the dhana so these four types of muktis is the real dhana dhana or wealth man has to acquire and treasure we have to treasure this wealth which is salokya samipya sayujya sarupya sarupya sayujya but today man is craving for dhana money forgetting this sa salokya samipya sarupya sayujya so swami says we go after money ignoring the sa so nidhana but so the real wealth swami is saying the sadhana okay so the same concept so who is the nidhana so another meaning of nidhana pat nidhana pati ni nivritti it's inner so you can say nidhana is the inner wealth ni is inner wealth is dhana which is all auspicious divine qualities in us that is a real wealth which swami wants us to cultivate because it, all this has to happen internally so our mind should be thinking of the lord mind should feel close to the lord mind should take on the form of the lord and the mind should completely merge or the inner antaka arana so you can say nidhana also is inner wealth so the lord of the inner wealth is also shiva so i thought uh, that is the meaning of the first name nidhana pataye namaha okay we'll go to the next mantra nidhana patantikaya namaha nidhana patantikaya namaha so the this again the fourth vibhakti or to that nidhana the patantikaha so nidhana patantikaha is the first uh, form of the noun which is a simple noun okay so to that nidhana pat nidhana patantikaha salutations namaha is salutations nidhana we have already looked at it so i will not go into that patta Pata means reaching. In Tamil, they will say Shiva Patam. Okay, uh, means you reach the state of Shiva. Okay, Shiva Pata. So Pata means Pata also means going or falling down also Pata. So you go and rest. Uh, also Pata or reaching a state. Okay, Nitana Pata Antikaha. Antikaha means 
one who is present one who is near one who lasts till that time um, in many places you i, I was just looking around uh, there some place they will say the, who is the uh, who is the uh, who causes the death of death or something like that also people have said who brings about the end of death that is also another meaning but antikaha means one who is present who is there who is near and who is the one who is there till that end because when we die uh, you know no one can come along with us but lord shiva will be there even when we die and we are fully rested because he is waiting in the cremation ground or burial ground so antikaha means one who is present one who is near when we die so we should not have any worries we already said he is the lord of death or old of our end of our life but he will be there close to us near us taking care of us when the final end happens they say in kashi um, everyone who dies apparently lord shiva will chant rama nama in the ear and that's the belief with which everyone goes and tries to die there so kashi so one who is there when you are gone the lord is there still communicating with you so one who is very near you one he keeps you close to that him so nidhana patantikaya namaha salutation to the one who remains when the final state is attained one who lasts till the final state everyone will come some people will come to the, till the doorway some people come to the cremation ground but he comes beyond that along with us wherever we go so when everything the world comes to a dissolution also the lord shiva is there that lord to that lord we bow down so those are the two mantras with the, the first two mantras we will go to the next mantra <clears throat> Urdhvaya Namaha. Urdhvaya. Okay. This is ir. This dh is the fourth dha, just like nidha. Urdhvaya Namaha. Urdhvaya Namaha. Again, it's the fourth vibhakti to that Urdhva. So the simple name is Urdhvaha. Urdhvaha. <clears throat> the meaning which is given is one who is high up or who is upward moving, who is erect. All these meanings are given for the word Urdhvaha. One who is standing, sitting straight or standing straight, you say Urdhva. So one who is above is also called Urdhva is up above. So that you can see the one who moves upward is also who is who is not held down by the earth if i can just move up that means i am not caught caught by the gravity so the thing is shiva is one who is who can freely move up who is not held down by the shackles of this world see we all say you know when you know people, people say they will pray up you know, so there are many people say, you know, no one knows in this earth which is up, which is down. So the one who is on one side of the earth can say this side of the sky is high, up, above. The other side of the earth, you know, see people say that side is up. So people may make a, so they will say there's nothing called up. But what is up is, because the earth pulls us down. The earthly desires pull us down. Urdhva is one who is not held down by the desires or the attractions of this earth. That person is Urdhva. So that's why we look up to know the Lord who is not held down by all the earthly attraction, distractions and the pulls. So that person is Urdhva. So to that Lord, our salutation. Okay, so why we pray to him? So he will pull us from all these bonds. In every pull from this earth, 
the gravity, the earth has an ability to pull us down. He frees up, frees us from all that. So who is capable of that? That Lord is Urdhva. Okay. I thought I will um, discuss a Gita shloka here again. I will. It's, I have put the full shloka because I thought uh, rather than pick a section, a uh, full shloka will be good. I hope you all are okay with me, you know, uh, bringing such references uh, because then the meaning is then only it's complete. Otherwise, you know, we'll say high up above the Lord we are praying, you know, so it does not necessarily uh, give us an inner feeling of how to relate to it. So that's why I thought I will pick a few. <clears throat> okay. And I will, you will find out reason because Swami himself has used some of this. So that's one of the reasons. Urdhva Moolam Madhah Shaka Mashvattam Urdhva Moolam Madhah Shaka Mashvattam Prahu Ravyayam Prahu Ravyayam Chandamsi Chandamsi Yasya Parnani Parnani Yastam Yastam Veda Sa Veda Vit Veda Vit Urdhva Mula Madhakshaka Mashvatham Prahura Vyayam Chandam si yasya parnani yastam vedasa vedavit. So, this is the shloka, first shloka of the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. We'll just go word by word. Urdhva means above. Moolam is a root. Adakh means below. Shakam is branch. Shaka means branch. Shaka means branch. Ashwatam. Ashwatam is there are two, three meanings given. We can just call it sacred victory. Some people think it is the um, banyan tree. Swami has called it banyan tree. But some people call it the bow tree or whatever we call um, the tree under which Lord Buddha is in Nirvana. Okay, this that's also called Ashwatthama because it always shakes. Ashwatthama. Prahuhu, they say. Prahuhu, they say. Avyayam means which never perish, imperishable. Vyaya is to one waste away. Avyaya means it will never waste. Chandamsi is Chandas is Veda. Okay, Chandamsi means so. Vedas. Okay, simple meaning. Yasya, whose? Yasya means whoever. Okay. Whosoever theirs, you know, of Parnani leaves. So Yasya Parnani it means whosoever leaves. Leaves. Parna means leaf. Parnani means plural. Leaves. Yaha is whoever tam sorry i should change this to that okay i will put, sorry object this way veda no saha he is Veda with. Okay. So I'll just give the meaning. They speak of an imperishable tree with roots above and branches below. Whoever knows that that leaves of which are the Vedas. So whoever knows, Yaha Tam Veda. Tam Veda means knows that. Yasya Parnani, 
whose leaves are the Vedas. Okay. Yasya Parnani, Chantamsi Yasya Parnani. The Vedas are that person's leaves. Okay. Tam Veda, who knows that? Or who knows that person also? Who knows the fact? Or who knows uh, that object? Saha Veda Veda. That person is the knower of the Vedas. Who was a learned Vedic person. Okay. Veda with. Veda is Vedas. With means one who knows. So this peak of an imperishable tree with roots above and branches below. Whoever knows that, leaves of which are the Vedas, is the knower of the Vedas. So, <clears throat> Swami is giving an explanation, so we will look at that. There's this description, the, there's a tree which is upside down, the roots are above and the branches are below. And that is this world in the creation also. The source of everything of this, in this creation is above. So this is the root from which the source, from which everything grows in this world. So that's where the tree is upside down. And anyone who knows what the root is, that source of all this, which is nothing but God, Brahman, that person knows all the Vedas. Because all these leaves are the Vedas. But if you know who the person, the, the source of that is, only the person who knows the source will know all the Vedas. Okay. So knowing that is that means that Urdhvam is Brahman. Urdhvamulam is Brahman himself. So I thought I will just use the where it is used. Okay. Uh, so I have gone back to the meaning again. Urdhvaya Namaha means salutation to the supreme source of all the Vedas, the root above. Okay, that's the meaning. Now I will go to what Swami has explained about Urdhva. Um, so as you can see, you know, whenever we give a meaning, we have to give a source of a spiritual literature, text. Only then then it's complete. So that is the traditional way of um, giving meaning. So I will, as much as possible, I will try to use them. And wherever possible, I can get Swami's quotations. I thought I will use them. So Urdhva, as explained by Swami. I'm just going to read. Usually the word Urdhva is taken to mean above or high, etc. This is Gita Vahini, I think chapter 25, okay, in the Gita Vahini, so that's where it is from. But if you consider the world to be a tree, then it has roots in Brahman. That is the roots are above and the branches are below. This was taught to Arjuna by Krishna Das. The tree of life, Samsara, is a very peculiar one. It is quite distinct from the trees of the world. So Swami is explaining Urdhva here, you can see. The trees that you see in the world have their branches above and roots below. Creation is like that because the, the word is the one where the root, we all spread, that becomes our source of sustenance. The tree of life, Ashwatta, however, has roots above and branches below. It's a topsy-turvy tree. Arjuna intercepted with the question, how did it get the name Ashwatha? It means a banyan tree, doesn't it? Why was the tree of life called so? Why wasn't it called by some other name? A strange name for a strange tree. Then Swami says, listen. I think someone is... Uh, I'm just going to mute. Yeah, someone is here. Okay, sorry. About it. Okay, Ashwatha means impermanent, transient. It also means the banyan tree. 
because ashwatha is that which continuously shakes also not unsteady also you see its flowers and fruits are good neither for smelling nor for eating however its leaves quiver ceaselessly in the wind so it is also called quivering leaves worldly objects are also ever wavering ever unsteady ever changing positions in order to make people understand this truth and strive to overcome it it is called ashwatha this disquisition is to make one develop the higher vision and yearn for steady faith in brahman higher vision means urdhva vision and yearn for steady faith in brahman the objective world can truly be understood only by the two types of examination the outer and the inner there is the reasoning that binds and reasoning that liberates he who sees the world as world sees wrong he who sees it as the highest atma paramatma sees right the world is the effect it has a cause it cannot be different from the cause it is just a mutation of brahman which constitutes it the millions of beings are the branches twigs and the leaves the seed is brahman in which all the tree is subsumed and summarized he who knows this knows the vedas so this is what swami says this krishna taught arjuna so urdhva is that brahman so urdhvaya namaha means he is the source of everything in this world okay so that is the meaning of the word urdhvaya namaha many things we discussed is already mentioned by swami she is talking about inner and outer which is nidhana so you can say nidhana pataye namaha nidhana patantikaya namaha urdhvaya namaha they are all related describing the same concept everything comes from that and everything goes back to that um, that is explained in these three mantras so i will go to the next mantra urdhva lingaya namaha urdhva lingaya namaha so it's urdhva and linga urdhva we have already looked at upwards i have just given a meaning but you all know it's brahman brahman itself maybe i should put the word brahman because we have already discussed it okay the highest being linga is symbol mark or pointer so it symbolizes that lord that is linga in tamil the word we use is kuri kuri means it points out so it's a indication of something indicator pointer all that is linga so salutation to the symbol of that supreme knowledge and the highest state so that's the meaning i have given urdhva lingaya namaha so i thought this is um, <clears throat> some sanskrit uh, concept in philosophy there are certain concepts called nyaya okay so they are um, the multiple uh, nyaya it means maxims you can say or or a rule rule which is used so i there is something called shaka chakha chandra nyaya shaka chandra nyaya okay so i this i am using this shaka chandra nyaya for the explaining linga okay so shaka means we already looked at some of the section earlier Uh, describing you know that uh, one of the shaka of uh, krishna yajurveda is taitriya okay so shaka is a branch chandra means moon nyaya so the branch moon maxim 
okay nyaya so what is this is i will just read it out and then explain the maxim of the branch and the moon a phrase denoting that an object seen or matter discussed has its position or relation assigned to it merely from the appearance of closeness so for example in the night uh, we take a small child out and then we see the moon we have noticed the moon and we are trying to point the moon to the child so we will see see look at the tree look at the branch see just above the branch there is moon that is moon so you show the uh, branch which is closer to that moon to point the moon out so you can say it's so close that it's it looks as if moon is resting on it on the branch see that the moon is resting on the branch that is the moon but actually the moon is so far away but it allows us to direct our gaze towards the moon so that is linger anything which takes our attention to the source which actually is so far beyond that object is called linger so anything which points okay so that is i thought i will just point that out so urdhva lingaya so the, the linga which points to that urdhva to the brahman to that so but the lord himself becomes the linga and points to himself that is why he is called urdhva linga uh, and we bow down to him so again i uh, took something from swami's discourse it's a discourse uh, from shivaratri of 1969 i'll just read out just as om is the sound symbol of god just as om is the sound symbol of god the linga is the form symbol of god symbol or the visible symbol of god the most meaningful the simplest and the least endowed with the appendages of attributes lingam means that in which this jagat the world of change attains laya mergence or dissolution liyate liyate iti linga means one when we attain we merge into that that becomes the linga all forms merge in the formless at last shiva is the principle of destruction of all names and forms shiva is the principle of destruction of all names and forms of all entities and individuals so the linga is the simplest sign of emergence and mergence so emergence everything emerges from that and everything goes back to that so the concept of urdhva and nidhana it everything comes from there is the root source and it goes back to that so the linga symbolizes everything which comes and goes i thought i will just uh, um i don't know many some of you may know see what happens no uh, when a person dies uh, we bury the, uh, we burn the body and the ashes are taken and the ashes are taken and uh, 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 immersed okay dissolved in running water so what happens is if you go they will say bring a stone and come along with the ashes so they will usually people take a brick and go in tamil they will say kall kall puse a stone is taken okay and the stone is taken and the ash is taken and they do a, some rituals the stone stands for the atman the imperishable atman ash is the perishable body that is the concept and we take everything and much so that linga once a person dies that person is in a form of a linga the atman is a linga so that is a ritual which happens many may I, many of you may not know that that's what they do so you say the what belongs to the body is all ash and that goes back to nature 
and the lingam or the, the kallu or the stone is also worship the atman which is imperishable and that is also taken to the river and let go because it merges in the layam in the waters running water because the water runs and joins the ocean so this birth and death is nothing but coming from the lord brahman and going back to the brahman this concept has been amply described in these four mantras nidhana pataye namaha nidhana patantikaya namaha urdhvaya namaha urdhva lingaya namaha um, so that's those are the four names which i had prepared it's 10 o'clock um, i hope uh, I, I didn't run or rush too much okay sairam sister aruna you have a question sairam brother the udvaya namaha when we were learning that came to my mind is i'm just saying okay um mind is something is originate from i don't know urdhva is the tamil when you equal unto urvaha utradatha yes like that is that is something uh, goes with that uh, explanation it's something yeah, like urdhva is yeah you can say you know it's it's a source because some of the, you should understand so many of these words actually come from similar similar roots sounds um so yes if that thank uh, you thank you, thank see you. The, meanings are many many i have just picked something which i ca- i could have grasped i have grasped uh, but i'm sure there are many other ways of explaining so you yeah, sorry because there are no sorry, questions sorry uncle um you know um for the, regarding the ashwatha um example like in the gita shloka yes. um the branches or i guess the leaves are referred to as the veda yes and when swami's explanation um he says the leaves and the branches are are like the world is that right yes, yes. so the thing is see uh, swami gives the answer there itself so let's go okay <clears throat> there is a reasoning that binds okay he who sees the world as world sees wrong he who sees it as highest atma sees right so the leaves are all created things okay but they they are each of them is actually teaching you something what are they teaching that they are brahman that is the veda to know that so the branches of the leaves is actually the lord is trying to teach us through everything created so there is knowledge in everything but we forget the knowledge is nothing but god also so the sprinkling of the lord is present in the creation so we when we see creation that's why swami says uh, swami is talking about outer and inner okay uh, so i think your question is uh, see the quivering leaves the leaves are quivering and they are basically but we only see the quivering leaf the external part of it okay which is all this creation okay but there is something within that there is something permanent in that which is paramatma so the knowing that paramatma is veda so the knowledge is actually in every see in everything which we see there is knowledge hidden from our sight but what we see is the creation but within that creation which is actually the external thing is meaningless the inner inner thing is what is meaningful so both the world creation means the root is there and the world has come to into being and we are looking at the external world but we have to learn to see the inner because that is some of the he is he who sees the world as world sees wrong he who sees it as the highest atma sees right that seeing it as highest atma is veda cha chandam shi parnane i hope i answered your question yes thank you that really clarifies it yes. so that is why it so it is embedded in that meaning 
Okay, so I think if you go back to Urdhamulam Adashakam Ashwattam Prahuravyayam. Okay. We think the world creation is Urdhva there, Adashakam, and people see. But Swami says, in those that creation, Krishna is saying, Chandamsi par, Parnani. Okay. Who sees, who knows that there is Veda in every single one. Chandam, Chandas, Chandas, or Chandas, plural is Chandamsi. So if one who sees the Chandas in every leaf, mm -hmm. that person is the knower of the Vedas, which is what Swami in his own discourse calls it at the end. He who knows this, knows the Vedas. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we can grab onto the leaves and the branches and climb our way up to the top. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Sai Ram, I don't know. Yes, Sai Ram, auntie. Just a little bit of clarification. This banyan tree, the branches, they go down, roots come up. The flowers or fruits are not good for smelling or for eating. The leaves are quivering. See, and all these, the illusions, the maya that we see outside and getting, cutting this banyan tree is not that easy. That attachment has to be understood. So this is the knowledge we have to get. Is that what is teaching us? Because the seed is Brahma, underground seed is Brahma. So it is hidden. We have to get the knowledge to see the Brahma and realize the Brahma. Is that true through this? Yes, uh, I think, theme? yes, Swami wants us to see within. Within. See inside everything which we see and see, yeah. learn to see the divinity. That's why. So the answer. Brahma is within, like how the seed is hidden under the ground. Yes, I think so. Thank you, Sairam. Sairam, Sairam. And you know, now banyan tree, I don't know whether you all know, it has what are called prop roots. The roots actually start from the top and come down and sometimes we don't know which is the root which is the stem because roots start from there and comes down and then the tree grows also so that's why it is another root above so they are called prop roots that's a technical term i guess but sairam um, sairam uncle uh, you had mentioned that um the concept of shiva didn't exist at the time um of the vedas and similarly, you had mentioned same with Ganesha. Yes. Um, so I guess, when did these concepts of Shiva and Ganesha as we know them now, like where and when did they come up? See, the thing is time-wise, you know, they're all thousands of years ago. But what happened was um, to explain certain concepts. See, we have what are called Puranas. Veda Vyasa wrote the Puranas also. So what happened was, um, because many of these concepts are very abstruse. Um, they are not very well defined, uh, abstract. The common man or the one who may not given to that kind of thinking may not be able to grasp it. So to help them focus uh, and find something to, a lingam, you know, something so that which will help them uh, understand the concept, remember the concepts, they described it in different films. So they are all what are called Pauranika or Purana concepts. So that also happened along the same time. Veda Vyasa who, so they must have been prevalent at the same time because um, if you take a scientific concept, you try to, you know, there's a story of uh, Einstein. Einstein apparently went and uh, talked about the theory of relativity somewhere. And he talked and talked, he put these physics, you know the formulas and explained some when he came down one person asked lay person asked look here you you're telling so many things i don't understand anything but what is this theory of relativity or something like that i don't know i'm just remembering a story which he says you know look here if you're sitting on a chair time you know uh, is you you relax and it takes five minutes if you sit you will think it's a, a lot it is not much time five minutes, you know, you'll say very little. If you, if you on a hot plate, you know, on fire, if you sit for five minutes, how long does it? 
so it feels like you know five minutes looks like you know five lifetimes so that is theory of relativity so he gave an episode so now the fire is introduced a chair is introduced and the experience is introduced so the person gets the idea of what that concept of relative is. so the same way the Puranic Puranic stories also came about but the rishis first they discovered then and they put down the Vedic texts and then uh, they also must have told stories for the common lay person or children for them to understand these concepts so that they can get keep it in memory so i think they were maybe contemporary contemporaneous but but they came after the vedic discoveries uh, which rishis employed to explain these concepts but then there are people who date they will say uh, 10000 years ago was the rig vedic period then comes the yajur veda period this theory of evolution is something which people talk about but i think as soon as somebody discovers a concept when they come and try to explain to others who have not seen it they will employ such descriptions but they were all uh, codified later by veda vyasa into puranas so astadasha 18 puranas veda vyasa who uh, codified veda is supposed to have written to explain some of these concepts okay so i hope uh, that's it. that's when I see, that's why I said it comes after. So the first the discovery of the concept, then the explanation of the concept. So in that sequence, Puranas came later. But in Vedas, you will not find because they were the discoveries directly from the divinity defined. Uh, but this is an explanation of a human person. So that's why Puranas are not considered Vedas. I hope I yes. answered you. Yes, thank you so much. So um, we're, we're not saying linga here, like Urdhva linga. Um, is it referring to like, you know, the Shiva lingam that we are familiar with or any uh, like avatars or what, what is it referring to? So linga, which from that time uh, is, you know, as Swami himself explained, there are no limbs. See, mm -hmm. there is, in Tamil, we will say Uruvam, Aruvam, Aruvuruvam. Rupa Rupa. Rupa means to have form. Arupa means no form. Rupa Rupa means that which has form and it doesn't have form. Shivalinga forms that category. It, it is a form, but it doesn't have the forms which we normally see. So it is it is a transitionary stage. And the, if you look at the lingam, it is not circle, it is ellipsoid or oval. The reason it looks as if it is ending. But actually, you can come back. Again, it looks as if it's ending and starting. But actually, you can circle it. But it gives the impression of, you know, there's an end and there's the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the Swami in another discourse also, he says, Shiva, actually, Shiva stood as the linga, the fire of lingam. Okay. Linga of fire or whatever. Fire lingam. And Vishnu and Brahma are supposed to try to search for the end and the beginning. And they couldn't. So it symbolizes that which seems to end but doesn't end that seems to begin but doesn't begin so they found that shape very uh, interesting because in uh, you know, brother kumar raised his hand he is uh, one very interested in space in space the even the movement of planets are elliptical mm -hmm. he may be able to explain a little more than what i am doing but uh, so these were observed by rishis they thought everything is going on this oval shape earth planets everything is moving so they said this is the shape of the lord this is the form of the lord everything is uh, you know revolving around that lord so these were concepts with which they gave us this gift of linga and um, even vaishnavites have uh, shaligrama which is also a similar stone so i will, i hope i answered your question yes thank you so much So we will go, um, I think there are no questions, almost 10.30. So yes, right. as sister said, I will just chant the, yeah. So the first name, okay, I will chant it three times. Nidhanapataye namaha, Nidhanapataye namaha, Nidhanapataye namaha. 
निधन पतांतिकाय नम निधन पतांतिकाय नम निधन पतांतिकाय नम ऊर्ध्वाय नम ऊर्ध्वाय नम ऊर्ध्वाय नम ऊर्ध्वलिंगाय नम ऊर्ध्वलिंगाय नम ऊर्ध्वलिंगाय नम विल क्रोस विथ समस्त लोक ओ समस्तोका सुखिनो समस्तोका सुखिनो समस्तोका सुखिनो ओ शांति 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 साईराम